Hello, folks. Um, you are, as you trickle in, um, take a look here at um, the fantastic partners that we have in our new energy, um, our new energy program and um, the new energy series that we are um, kicking off once again today. So um, I'm, my name is Amanda Graham, and I am very happy to welcome you to um, the Fall 22 edition of um, New Energy. Uh, this series was launched three years ago as a platform for young energy and society scholars to share their work. And as a result of that, not only do they share their work with each other, but also with us. Um, it's a, the series is a wonderful way to stay on top of some of the um, upcoming developments of young scholars in the energy space. And we've also been really thrilled to develop uh, the beginnings of a community among these um, young scholars. We convened about 20 of them uh, uh, here in Hanover, New Hampshire in June for our very first New Energy Summit. Um, and one of those New Energy Summiteers was um, our speaker for today, uh, Jessica Dunn. And I am very pleased to introduce Jessica. Jessica, who is the very newly minted um, Dr. Jessica Dunn. Um, she finished her doctorate last month in energy systems at the University of California, Davis, and she has um, joined the Union of Concerned Scientists as a senior analyst. Um, in her past record, um, Jessica was a co-facilitator for the California Lithium Ion Battery Recycling Advisory Group, as well as a private consultant for the IEA, the International Energy Agency. She's also been an analyst at Three Degrees, which is a, um, a firm that we that's near and dear to our hearts. One of our board members is a um, is the one of the co-founders of Three Degrees. Uh, Jessica has also been a fellow at the Breakthrough Institute um, and a renewable energy operator um, of uh, wind energy in several regional markets. So she really um, she knows energy from nuts to bolts and everywhere in between. Uh, her master's degree is from the University College in London um, in economics and policy of the environment and energy. And with that. That. Um, Jessica, I would love to hand things over to you for your talk on lithium ion battery material circularity. Um, so um, welcome all, welcome Jessica and, um, and take it away. After Jessica speaks for about 30 minutes or so, I'll come back to moderate folks' questions. If you have questions throughout the talk, please throw them into the Q and A um, and we will get to them um, when we have our, um, our open session. Jessica, over to you. Thank you, Amanda. Let me uh, share my screen. There we go. Um, so thank you for that very generous uh, introduction. I will be talking, as Amanda said, about lithium ion battery material circularity. Um, and you already heard about me, uh, but I do a lot on batteries and I'm continuing that work for my PhD. So I'm very excited to kind of share the field in general. Um, today, I will be going over kind of what is battery material circularity, why it's important, and then also talk about current policy development, both at the federal and the state level with a focus on California. Um, so let's start with basics. Uh, you know, I, in my profession, really dive into, um, would say the impacts of electric vehicles, the negatives, but I like to first start with the positives so that we're all kind of on the same, uh, we have the same basis of understanding. So why transition to electric vehicles? Why transition the transportation system, uh, you know, away from gasoline? The first, I think probably obvious reason is to decrease climate change impacts. Um, so you can see on this chart to the right, the EV is battery electric vehicle and ICE is internal combustion engine, there's just a lot lower greenhouse gas emissions over the life cycle of these two vehicles from an electric vehicle. There's also um, no uh, local pollutants from electric vehicles. So these local pollutants lead to asthma and other health problems and are really, um, they really impact kind of low income communities that are located near um, a lot of transportation routes. So that's something we, we really want to see uh, a change in. Thirdly, um, there's reduced dependency on oil. So these are three just like high level reasons to transition to electric vehicles and, and why this is a good um, decision you know, for, for our system. So with that transition, um, there will be a lot of, uh, a lot of batteries needed. So this means there will be a very big 
increase in demand for um, light duty vehicles. We're talking about like passenger cars as well as heavy duty. So commercial trucks, um, buses. Um, this is something that, you know, to a scale that we haven't seen before for batteries, much larger than anything for consumer electronics demand. And with that comes the need for um, increased materials as well. So we're talking about uh, cobalt, we're talking about nickel, we're talking about manganese, we're talking about lithium. Those are the kind of critical materials that you've probably heard about you know, in the news or, or highlighted when we're talking about batteries. But we're also gonna need more copper and aluminum as well. So with that increased battery demand, are hurdles to overcome. Um, the first of which are EVs are material intensive. They require a lot of these critical materials, kind of like I just stated. Um, the mining of those materials have environmental and social impacts. So, um, you know, one issue that's highlighted a lot is the, um, the human rights violations that happen in, in the Democratic Republic of Congo when um, cobalt is mined. There's child labor associated, there's pollution, there's displacement, corruption, conflict. Um, but we also hear about this in the US, right? There's a lot of pollution and, um, and uh, conflict with, with Native Americans who, who and um, local communities. Uh, thirdly, there's also uh, a bunch of vehicles reaching the end of their life that must be handled differently than internal combustion engines. So we haven't seen a big wave yet, but um, there's a very big network set up to deal with internal combustion engines, to dismantle them, to reuse the parts, to recycle them. And this will look very different for EVs just because the, um, the battery must be you know, dealt with differently just due to safety and um, due to the technology, and it must be recycled in a different manner. So this will be different, um, different parties handling the, the batteries. Uh, luckily, there are paths to kind of reducing these impacts and these uh, getting over these hurdles, one of which is um, material circularity. So when we, we talk about material circularity, we're talking about repurposing batteries, so taking batteries out of an EV and giving them a second life. That's here on the side of this, this circularity diagram. Um, we're talking about recycling the batteries eventually so that we can recover those materials that are in them. And then we're talking about using that um, material that's recovered into the manufacturing of uh, new batteries. This is, you know, a process that can continue and continue and continue, and it makes it so that we don't have to mine additional materials. And with that, um, another way to reduce impacts is technological innovation. So many or um, innovating batteries so that they use less materials, and so that um, so that uh, overall we can we can uh, basically stop mining at some point. <laughs> So let's first dive into um, that first step that I talked about in this material circularity of repurposing. This picture is of BTU uh, and they're a startup in California and they're one of many. And what they do is they repurpose the batteries. So they take EV batteries that have retired from their use in an electric vehicle. They still have leftover capacity. So they, it's estimated that the batteries should have 70 to 80% capacity. Although BTU has also said that some of them that they receive and use have 60% capacity. They take the whole pack, they connect those packs together into these shipping containers, and then it's you know, one much bigger battery. And they use this battery to support solar PV systems. So basically they have a solar, uh, solar generating in the middle of the day when there's not a peak demand, but there's high sun. And then the, um, the battery releases the energy in the evening when there is a peak demand. So this is a pretty common repurposing application. Um, and it's something that if anyone's familiar with the duck curve can, can very much help that in California. Yeah. So after batteries repurposed, you know, eventually we, we want all these batteries to go to recycling. So, um, this, these are some pictures from Stelco uh, Recycling. 
And this is a hydrometallurgical plant, which is the most common type of lithium ion battery recycling in North America. What this process does is it takes the batteries and then recovers those constituent materials that I said, uh, that I've been talking about, right? The cobalt, the nickel, the lithium, the manganese. Um, and they recover it so that it can be used then again in the manufacturing of new batteries. Um, so to just kind of take you through this, on the left side, you see um, that's a battery pack on the pallet. And, um, and that's you know a battery pack that's been removed from an electric vehicle. And then in the center, you'll see that they have disassembled the, pa uh, the pack down to the cell level. So they aren't always disassembled to the cell, which is a much smaller level. Sometimes they're disassembled to a module, which is uh, it's several cells packed together. Um, and what's happening here is that the, the pack or the cells are going along the conveyor belt and then they'll be mechanically uh, crushed so that they're breaking up all of these batteries into very small pieces. At that point, they sift the, the remnants, they uh, use magnets to separate the ferrous to non-ferrous um, materials, and they take, um, take this kind of black powder that comes out that contains the, um, the, those materials that I've mentioned over and over again, uh, the nickel, the cobalt, the manganese, the lithium, and they put it through this hydrometallurgical process, which uses leaching and some other techniques to then recover the materials. So let's look at kind of what the infrastructure looks like right now in the US and well, North America. Um, there's a lot of uh, recycling plants that use hydrometallurgical recycling that are planned. And there's also um, a, several that are already uh, already recycling. So one that gets kind of, the name gets thrown a lot, around a lot is Redwood Materials, they're in Nevada. Um, and they were started um, by a co-founder of Tesla. And they're actually, they're positioned next to uh, the Tesla Gigafactory because a lot of the recycling that they're currently doing is actually from manufacturing scrap or from batteries that are faulty or under warranty and failed. Um, and so that's kind of the bulk of, of the recycling that's happening right now. When car, when EVs start to age out, when they start to reach their, their natural um, kind of failure, we think probably at that 15 year range, we're gonna see a big wave of batteries that need to be recycled. And that's kind of, that's gonna be a different stage of what this recycling looks like. Um, but we see a lot of planned facilities kind of ramping up for, um, for that next upcoming wave. Um, so this kind of, this next, I think, natural question is how much of U.S. demand can be met with recovered supplies? So we're talking about recycling, we're talking about, uh, you know, the benefits of, of being able to recover these materials and then use it in the manufacturing. You know, what scale is that at? Um, in the short run, in 2030, um, it, we, it looks like about 10% of nickel and cobalt can be from recycled materials and about, you know, 5% of lithium. So that might seem, you know, so pretty small, but when we look longer in 2050, um, that recovered material can be up to, you know, 40, 50% for, for nickel and for cobalt, but then 20% for lithium. So in the short run, you know, it looks like it's not gonna meet that much of demand, but there is, uh, you know, great potential in the long run. And this is looking at percentages when there is a, um, you know, there's a growing demand of, of EV batteries. And this is also taking um, into, or not taking into consider consideration technological innovations such as, um, you know, solid state batteries or those batteries that we hope to see in the future that use, uh, use less material per, um, per energy delivered, also called, uh, you know, higher energy density. So I've been talking about these benefit, benefits of recycled materials, um, the benefits being displaced mines materials, lower environmental and social impacts, as well as like a local source, despite the lack of local reserves. Um, but I want to kind of give proof to that. Um, this is from a paper that I recently wrote, uh, looking at the difference between the recycling emissions and the emissions from mining. 
So that's what's called avoided emissions here. And that is green. So the recycling emissions, um, you know, there are some mostly due to uh, due to energy and also from the, um, the chemicals that are used in the processing of hydrometallurgical. Um, but we see that the net emissions is negative, meaning that if you use recycled materials, you are saving a lot of emissions over if you are going to mine those. And that's looking at CO2, that's looking at SOX, and that's looking at NOx. So kind of transitioning away from, um, from what the process looks like and, and kind of the um, research that supports it, let's talk about how policy is supporting a circular battery economy. This is something, um, you know, Amanda mentioned, I have, I was part of a um, advisory group co-facilitating for California, and this research is really coming from there. So federal policy um, is mostly funding of research and development. You know, there was some money um, put in there for the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, there's been money in the past that's gone to resell, which is, um, you know, a collaboration with Argonne National Lab that, um, that researches uh, recycling innovation. There's also critical material sourcing requirements, part of the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes critical material sourcing and manufacturing requirements from the US. Um, those sourcing requirements allow for recycled content to be met with them if it's recycled in the US. And there's also an extended producer responsibility task force that is part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. Um, but it's unclear if this includes EV batteries or if it is just looking at consumer electronics, which would definitely be disappointing. Um, so let's look further at the state level policy, something that's near and dear to my heart. Um, the California Assembly Bill 2832 in 2018, um, it was passed. And basically what it did is it convened a, a group of stakeholders within California, which is called the Lithium Ion Battery Recycling Advisory Group. And they were tasked with um, coming up with policy that could lead to as close to 100% as possible of lithium ion batteries to be recycled within the state of California and to give these recommendations to the legislature. So um, the report was released in, I think it was March of 2022. Um, and it had some, I think, uh, well, I may be biased because I was a co-author, but I think it had some very valuable information in there, which I'm going to share. The primary outcomes, so basically what they came up with as um, policies that should be enacted were uh, mainly to define the responsibility of the battery at the end of life. So who is responsible for recycling the battery and covering those costs? They also were concerned with um, increasing access to battery information throughout the life cycle, um, making sure that we support the end of life industry. So repurposing, reuse and recycling and help that get off the ground and to increase the safety and efficiency of reverse logistics. Um, reverse logistics refers to taking the battery from where it you know, reaches the end of its life. So if an EV owner has it and it dies and it, it can't be, um, it can't be fixed or anything like that. The reverse logistics would refer to that collection, the sorting of where the battery should go, and then also the transportation to that destination. So this may be a bit of a confusing slide, um, but it's uh, the advisory group came up with two possibilities for defining responsibility. Um, for the battery at the end of life. So meaning that somebody is going to be responsible for recycling and it's gonna, they suggest it should be a requirement that the battery is recycled, but there are two different options for that responsibility. The one on the left, core exchange and vehicle backstop. Um, this, was, uh, this was recommended by the auto industry and what they think is, and which was, was voted on by the advisory group is that um, the, Auto manufacturer is responsible for the recycling of the battery if, um, 
if if somebody calls them and and uh, it re the battery reaches their end of life. But if the um, battery or the vehicle is acquired by the uh, by a dismantler, and the dismantler removes part of the vehicle, then it's the responsibility of the dismantler to make sure this battery is recycled and pay for those those associated costs. The other recommendation was this producer taste back, and that is that the auto manufacturer is responsible to ensure the battery is recycled, no matter what. Um, this, both of these were recommended by the group, but the producer take back was um, not actually uh, voted on by the auto manufacturers, which is, I think, an interesting tidbit of information. So part of what the advisory group did is identify barriers and then um, and then basically um, suggest policy. And I kind of first want to go over these barriers. So one was the access to information. They identified that um, the information throughout the life cycle, meaning the, um, the battery state of health when the owner has the vehicle, the battery characteristics, such as the chemistry and the capacity, the state of health once the battery is retired, and instructions on how to remove it is something um, that is necessary to efficiently transport, reuse, and recycle batteries. So with that, they recommended policies to address these information needs, one being a physical labeling requirement. Um, this here on the right is kind of an example of that. Um, a digital identifier, which is the QR code here, just to give more information beyond what a label could do. And then at third is, a universal diagnostic system used to determine the state of health. So this would mean um, there would be the capability for, um, for a technician or for a repurposer to kind of plug into the battery and understand, you know, what is the state of health? Is this, um, does this have good capacity? Um, is it, what kind of efficiency does it have? And this would really help for um, you know, the end of life for them to determine if the battery should be reused, if it should be repurposed, or if it's just not safe to do those things and the battery should be recycled. The next barrier um, was the initial industry development. Um, in California, there has not been a hazardous waste processing facility uh, permitted within the last 10 years, and that came up as a concern of a kind of an uncertainty. Um, there's also upfront costs to recycling, and there's a concern about the cost competitiveness of reused and refurbished and remanufactured batteries. Um, it's pretty expensive to do the testing um, to, to determine the state of health of batteries. And because of the, the time span of that, um, the used batteries aren't um, you know, discounted to an amount that, that is, always, um, is always good for a consumer to choose a reused battery instead of a, a new battery. So the policies that were recommended um, were recycling incentive packages, as well as expanding um, the state funding for uh, that is provided for people who want to purchase uh, stationary storage batteries. It's kind of a grant to expand that to used batteries. So that was kind of an interesting, um, interesting suggestion. And Repurpose Energy uh, is a repurposing company that actually came out of UC Davis, and this is a uh, this is a picture into one of their stationary storage. Uh, batteries, you can see a bunch of modules are stuck together and it's in a shipping container. Kind of interesting looking. The next barrier um, was efficient reverse logistics. So there's safety risks, risks associated with transporting batteries, um, especially if we do not know if they're, um, if they're in good condition. Um, there's a high cost of transportation. Transporting the batteries at the end of life is about 50 to 60% of the recycling costs. Um, and then last, the location of EVs at the end of life is unclear because there is not an efficient system set up. Um, it's unclear if these batteries are, you know, sitting in a in a um, garage, if they are being collected at uh, dealerships. It's kind of unclear at the moment. That's something that needs to be figured out. So recommendations really um, centered around making sure that all dismantling facilities are licensed so that they're practicing uh, dismantling of EVs in a safe manner. 
There's also a lot around you know, developing training materials for people processing these batteries, as well as supporting research and developing better um, collection and sorting infrastructure networks. Last, there's also a suggestion that the federal go government update and clarify universe, universal waste regulations. So at the moment, um, if a battery is removed from a vehicle, it is considered hazardous waste, no matter if it's in good condition and is going to be reused and repurposed. So that adds additional costs, but that's something that has to happen um, at the federal level and not the state level. Um, so the group did not recommend any of the circularity policies. Um, this was personally kind of I found very disappointing. Um, these circularity policies were recycled content standards. So that requires a certain amount of um, materials in the manufacturing to come from recycled materials. This is something we see for uh, newspaper, for plastics. Um, another one that was not recommended was design for disassembly or recycling. So that's considering the disassembly in the design of the batteries and the EVs. Um, that's something that is you know, uh, required in China and in the EU. Um, there was no recommendation to report the recycling and repurposing rates. There was no uh, minimum material recovery requirements. So that's for recycling. There was no requirements for minimum material recovery. And uh, last, there was no requirement to um, have third party verification of the environmental social standards of recycling and of the um, recovery rates. So, uh, you know, I think the big question is like, why weren't these recommended? They weren't recommended uh, because many people felt that this is a, a growing industry and it's kind of in its infancy and there shouldn't be any barriers to developing that industry, be that the EV, uh, the EV industry or the recycling and repurposing industry. Um, but I think there's another kind of clue as to why that was recommended as well. Um, this is the advisory group membership. So there were it was a pretty good split between uh, different types of stakeholders, um, public interest organizations, automotive and battery industry, waste management, government agencies. Um, and the policies that were recommended had to have at least 50% of membership vote. Um, so as you can see right now, automotive and battery industry and waste management industry um, represent, you know, a little over 50%. But um, voting members of the advisory group looked very different. The um, government agencies here on the left recused themselves from voting. So uh, the makeup of votes was very uh, industry leading, the automotive and battery industry and the waste management industry. And um, the public interest organizations and some of the waste management were the only ones that um, voted for these circularity policies. Um, so that kind of defines that vote. Well, I hate to end on that <laughs> note, um, but, uh, but yeah, thank you for listening and um, I'm here to answer any questions. Jessica, thank you so much for um, for this um, really interesting presentation and deep dive into um, lithium ion um, circularity in EVs. Um, I learned a lot and I'm interested in learning more as we go forward here with um, with some Q&A. So we had a number of questions come in um, before um, today's panel and then questions are starting to come in in, in the Q&A. Thank you, folks. Please bring the keep bringing those in. And a couple of them. Uh, um, sort of call for a little bit of a, a basic review of EV batteries and their their length of life. How how long does an EV battery typically last in a um, in a uh, uh, currently? Um, and um, well, you mentioned that typically they are um, they reach an end of life in that application when they're sixty or seventy or eighty percent. Um, uh, uh, not 60% depleted, but 60% capacity still still available, if I'm understanding correctly. And and why is why is that the case? So a little bit more detail on sort of that um, introductory technology piece would be great. Yeah, great great question. Um, so 
let's start with kind of the first EVs that were out there, like the Nissan Leaf. Um, those technologies uh, had smaller batteries. Those EVs had smaller batteries and they had a shorter lifespan. So they had a lifespan of, I think it's estimated to be about eight years. Um, the reason for that had to do with a cooling system that wasn't working quite well. Um, and also because with smaller batteries, they're cycled more often. And so the more you cycle the battery, the faster it degrades. Um, the batteries in newer cars like Tesla, right? They're a hundred kilowatt hours. They're huge. Um, they will take you, I think it's like 300 to 400 miles. Um, these batteries aren't being cycled as much. So they aren't degrading as fast because when you drive your car, you're typically, you know, going a shorter distance than a hundred miles. And, uh, and at that point you're just, yeah, you're not depleting the battery all the way and then charging it all the way up. Um, so it's estimated. And again, these are very much estimates that the, um, the EV battery will last the length of a normal car. So something like 15 years. Um, it's again estimated that these batteries will have about 80% capacity when they're retired. And um, we've talked to BTU and they say, no, we, we've gotten batteries even down to 60%. So this is very much a range and very much uh, what is consumer use and what is consumer preference. Um, and, and you're totally right, Amanda, when you're saying that, uh, you know, the 60% is the amount of capacity left in the vehicle uh, battery. And so when it gets repurposed, this is, a, this is a different application, right? Where it doesn't matter how big the battery is. So just because it's, it's got lower capacity and it's still this large battery, that's okay because they're out there you know, next to, to solar PV fields. Um, and at that point, they're using them, I think until they feel they're not safe anymore. Um, and what that percentage is, you know, I, I'm kind of unsure. It's, it's estimated that around 80 or 70%, there's this knee where um, in the depletion where they start depleting much faster. And with the capacity decrease, there's also an efficiency decrease. So you're losing electricity as well. Okay. Um, so yeah, so that could, that could, I've read papers where they say, you know, in a second life application, the lifespan can range from six to 30 years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and is yeah. so and the fact that they're only 70 or 80 percent depleted, but they're not adequate for the EV um, functionality is because that functionality requires that the battery be at a higher level of depletion. Can you just briefly explain that? Yeah, it really comes down to consumer preference. So if you have a car that goes 100 miles uh, when you first buy it and suddenly it can okay. only go 60 miles on a charge. OK. Okay. People just kind of move on from that. Um, Got it. I've Got heard it. people say that like maybe these cars will be used by high school students, right? Because they only have to go to high school or something, or, or right, right. those kind of estimates. But okay, so it's really it's how much charge it will hold that depletes when you get below that that seventy or eighty percent. Thank you for helping us um, battery neophytes um, on that front. Um, let's see another question that um, that folks were posing. Um, it has to do with uh, you sort of at that materials chemistry um, state of things. Um, it, can you talk about um, the difference between lithium ion and solid lithium batteries? In other words, how long do you see lithium ion batteries being used? Do you see solid lith lithium batteries coming into play? What are the implications of that technology? And maybe just, just quickly for, for, again, the neophytes, what's the difference between lithium ion and solid lithium? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. So um, solid state batteries um, are a type of lithium ion battery. And what it, the solid is referring to is that they use a solid electrolyte instead of a liquid. So there's, uh, for some understanding, there's a cathode, there's an anode, there's, a, there's an electrolyte in the middle and some separators. Um, the the electrolyte, uh, if it hit, you know, if it, there's a leak, this could lead to an explosion. So that's that's kind of where the danger comes from as well. The solid means you're using some kind of uh, ceramic for that electrolyte, which means that there's also no risk of fire, which I think is kind of an interesting tidbit. 
Um, but what it also, uh, it also makes it so that the energy density can be higher within the battery. So energy density means that there is, um, there is basically less material needed to supply that energy. And, um, and this is great, right? Because then we don't need as much materials. We don't need to mine as much materials. And so I think that's a very big opportunity for the battery space to kind of become environmentally and uh, you know, socially uh, better. Um, there's some startups like QuantumScape that has a deal with Ford and they say that in the next couple of years they're gonna be coming out with a prototype. Um, I have yet to see it, but I really hope it comes out. <laughs> um, yeah, and they'd also, because it's, an, it's a solid, it allows for different chemistries to be used. So you could use lithium um, as the, yeah, in there as well, so. So would, would that have um, significant, it seems as though that would have significant implications on the material side, right? In other words, if we're going to solid lithium, I, you know, I'm imagining that that means that our our demand for the lithium material will go will go up as opposed to some of those other metals that you were um, that you were talking about in the recycling process. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so if we use uh, solid state batteries, right there, we because of the energy density increase, we would actually be using less like cobalt, less nickel, less right. uh, manganese. Right. And so that's a good thing. There could be some increase in lithium usage, um, but it's kind of just like a trade off and it seems advantageous at this time. Do you see any material scarcity issues? Um, I mean, you, you talked about, you, you flagged the issues of, um, of sourcing of materials, which which you know would persist, you know, until we have policies that put those that um, ensures ensure that we have, you know, safer mining processes. But do you see any simple materials issues if we if we shift to a solid lithium pathway? In other words, the sourcing. How much lithium do we have that's available, and who is in who is in control of that um, uh, that resource? Yeah. Yeah, um, I don't see any lithium scarcity issues. Um, there's enough out there, I would say, to and that's been you know reported that there's there we can definitely um, mine the amount that we need until I think 2100 or something like that. Um, and there's more uh, you know reserves being found over time, especially with the uh, with the cost the price increase. Um, there's some really interesting projects happening in the U.S. So um, I don't know if you've heard of Lithium Valley, which is um, near the Salton Sea. And they are a, a new potential mining development, which would use um, the geothermal plants that are there and build some more to recover uh, lithium. And this is a lot more environmentally friendly. Um, lithium recovery than what's currently happening in like Chile or or Australia, and um, it has yet to be, be demonstrated. I think at scale, um, and they still have to go through the environmental regulations and permitting process. Um, but I think there is big potential there to provide kind of a lower impact lithium, and there's a lot of lithium there, um, a lot. So I think mm -hmm. they've predicted that it's like enough to supply the whole US kind of thing. So it's- Okay. Um, okay, mm -hmm. great. So I'm gonna do one more um, uh, sort of technology oriented question. And then I'm interested in shifting a little bit to the policy implications um, that you were that you were discussing. Um, Adam Knowlton Young asks us um, uh, or, or states um, uh, that the upsides of EVs in controlling climate change are contingent on the quality of electricity and the grid that feeds those batteries. And Adam, yes, you are quite right that um, the source of um, electricity is not a neutral source, right? It is. Um, it depends on how you create that electricity, right? Whether your energy is is clean and green or or less so. Um, and so he asks, if we're using dirty energy, then we have to think about both the 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 cost of mining plus the cost of using that energy. For example, if it's coming from a, a coal-fired power plant instead of from a um, a, a solar farm. Um, given issues with the circularity policy on batteries, what does that leave us for net gains um, in the anticipated surge in demand for EVs and batteries, right? So if we're looking at this at a more of a systems perspective, um, what, what's, how would you characterize the net gains for EVs um, given the sort of changing state of the energy sources on the grid and the differences from location to location? 
Yeah, that's a really good question and something that comes up a lot in um, in in this field. So uh, there's actually a report recently put out by the Union of Concerned Scientists called Driving Cleaner um, that has a very good graphic that I will send to you maybe. Um, and so basically, uh, you know, EVs are still a better alternative when considering the whole life cycle impacts, including the mining and all those, those associated and processing and shipping and everything, then the gasoline vehicles for, I think, pretty much everywhere in the US, taking into consideration the grid. So the only place that I think that didn't hold true was an island um, by Hawaii that only ran off diesel generators. Um, so that really demonstrates, I think, that, you know, we don't have to have a perfectly clean grid for them, EV batteries, to be a better source. Um, and I think, you know, as the, um, as the grid continues to become cleaner, these EVs are even more advantageous. And there's also, um, you know, other benefits besides climate change particularly uh, if we look at like local pollutants. So pollutants that are that people are inhaling directly like particulate matter and how those um, really impact a lot of low income communities because they're centered near highways, near freeways where a lot of this, this like large truck transportation happens. Um, and though breathing that in is really harmful for asthma, for cancer, those kind of those kind of issues. So, um, yeah, I would, I would very much recommend looking up this driving cleaner report by UCS because they have a graphic with a, um, a map of, uh, the U S and they have the EV miles per gallon equivalent for electric vehicles per state, which is very right. cool. So it ranges, I think in the, like Washington state, I looked at and it was a hundred and something. And so that's definitely great. Great, thank you for highlighting that resource, um, a good one. Um, uh, Leopold Peisler asks, um, do you think that the US recycling industry, and I, I presume we're talking about battery recycling industry, might fall behind the European or Chinese recycling industries? My understanding from you is that it already is behind, right? So we might wanna talk a little bit more about that. Um, but in because in those jurisdictions, the recycling industry is basically imposed, right? By uh, by mandating it. So so talk a little bit again about the um, the contrast between um, our, our the, the state of, of of EV battery recycling in the United States versus the state of, uh, of that in the EU and, uh, and in China. Yeah, uh, Leopold brings up a very good point that you know the European and, and Chinese uh, governments have much stricter standards than the US has. Not even much, they have recycling standards and right. the US does not. Right. Um, right. And so right. this is, yeah, that's, and that's huge. Um, but I've been actually pretty surprised by the right recycling development within the US um, within the last two years. Two years ago, when I was doing my PhD, I was I kept you know saying we need, really need to grow our recycling industry. We need to get on this. We need to start thinking about it. And then over the last two years, there's, there's been all these announcements about mm -hmm. um, recycling infrastructure development. And so I think that is great. And I think it shows that there's probably going to be positive economics in it. Um, but is it going to be enough? And are we going to be to the European and Chinese level? Maybe not. I think what we will definitely be behind in is the, um, the amount of recycled content that we're using in our batteries, because we don't have any requirements for that. And also the greenhouse gas emissions of our manufacturing, because the European Commission, they have a battery policy that they have announced. And it's it emphasizes those environmental standards and making sure that the process is clean and circular and not just looking at the battery end of life, but also looking at the um, manufacturing. Um, and so that I think is where we will be very behind in, um, in the US battery policy. Um, the US is more focused on recycling industry development through funding. Okay. So, so that goes a little bit to, to the uh, follow-on question that I wanted to ask, which is, 
uh, you, you know, you you dug uh, you dug into the California case study, right? About looking at the possibilities for policy in this space, and you know, you you, you gave our the, the poignant conclusion, right? To uh, uh, what was advised, what what recommendations came out of that group, and what and what didn't didn't. But even just the 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 level of detail of that policy discourse, right, was um, I think you know notable and could be instructive. What what do you see as the potential or the possibility for that level of conversation taking off at the at the federal level. I mean, you, you had one slide that we breezed over pretty quickly, right, on federal level policy. You know, what, um, what, how would you, um, how do you in, envision the prospects for that call, policy conversation moving into the, the national, the national space? Yeah, I mean, I really hope it does. California is the, you know, the leader kind of right. on EV policy. Right. And so I can see, I can see this next legislative session, something being proposed by California and hopefully being passed. And, and I can see something within the next couple of years definitely happening there. Um, at the federal space, I I, I think it, yeah, I, I hope it does. And I think it could get started by this task force that was created by the, um, by the bipartisan infrastructure law. Right, if right. that task force includes electric vehicle batteries, but that's kind of to be determined at this point okay. because of the way that it's written. Okay. Um, I also think, you know, the automakers have a lot of pull and at this point they seem to be um, on board with a lot of the policy that is coming out of uh, of like the California advisory group. You know, they, they had a big strong uh, kind of leadership role in that. So I could see in them maybe um kind of spearheading that so that it goes the way they want as well um what do you yeah. see as the as the future in california right i mean has has the advisory board you know um been wrapped been wrapped you know as as the as a result of you know making recommendations is there a, a vision for a you know a phase a phase two to to you know address some of the other policy areas that were not um were not taken up or were not did not have recommendations made yeah, great question. There's not. So the advisory group is closed. Um, the report was released. That was what they were tasked with. Um, at this point, it's up to the legislature to kind of uh, make the next move. Uh, last legislative session, there was a bill that was proposed by Assemblymember Lee um, that was about recycling policy. Um, it didn't necessarily reflect kind of what was in the report, but I think it shows that there's kind of a uh, um, there's definitely motivation behind uh, the, the policymakers to maybe pursue this further. And I also think it's um, kind of a bipartisan issue at this point, it's just because material recovery and material criticality has been such a big part of um, the discussion around electric vehicles, both like at the state and federal level. So um, next steps are to be determined and hopefully they go somewhere. Got it. Got it. Okay. Well, and I'm, and I'm sure you'll actually, I'm sure you'll be in the mix from your UCS perch um, as that, as that goes forward. Um, what would you have us look for in the IRA, right? As the, as the IRA um, uh, gets um, uh, deployed and sort and sorted out, what, what should we look for in the rollout of that, um, of that uh, bipart bipartisan bill in the electric vehicle uh, space? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, there's definitely some material requirements for the electric vehicle um, uh, tax credits that are a bit uncertain at this point. It's uncertain if, if the automakers can reach them. Um, there's kind of some language that, that they're, they're trying to decipher. Um, so really just looking at, you know, what lawyers and, and policy uh, makers are saying that those requirements actually mean and what that will look like for the future. Um, one thing that I really think is cool in the IRA is that there is a um, tax credit for used EVs. Um, again, the details need to be fleshed out, but, uh, but I think that is such a great step forward um, just because you know used EVs, they can go to a different clientele. I know maybe I could afford a used EV. Right, right, <laughs> and right. Especially, yeah, and so, so these 
I think that, that is that is something new and something really exciting. I, I, I really appreciate you raising that point. I mean, I think when we talk about um, energy and environmental justice, one of the, you know, one of the core tenets there we want to think about is access, right? Who has mm -hmm. access to what kinds of technologies? Who has access to technologies that are cleaner? Who has access to technologies that, um, that improve their own, you know, energy um, bill, right? Reduce, reduce energy poverty. And I think that, that EVs is one of those technologies that if it, if it remains at the the level of multiple tens of thousands of dollars, then the savings from that, right, the economic savings from that are not available to, to populations who cannot afford that. So I think that mm -hmm. the, the, um, the opportunity for, for exploring and understanding the, the um, possibility for, um, for, the, for credits for used EVs is, is, um, you know, is a real potential, right, for something that could open up, right, that technology to a whole new demographic. Uh, and so I, I appreciate you calling that out as, as one of those things to watch. Um, so we're, we're running down here on the, on the top of the hour, and I, I have sort of two, uh, you know, two questions for you. One, one is, um, uh, what's next for you on your research pathway? So, so at UCS, what, what sort of um, uh, issues or questions with EVs may you bring forward in your work or what new topics may you be interested in exploring? What's next for your research portfolio? <laughs> I love that question. Um, yeah, so one question that I uh, kind of finished recently in my research was looking at if batteries should with high cobalt content um, should be repurposed or if they should go directly to recycling. Um, so looking at that from an environmental perspective on um, how good is our technological innovation at the moment. Um, and this is something that's kind of been discussed by recycling companies. Um, so the, the reason for that, that that question comes up is because? It's because um, right now the batteries are being engineered so that they have lower cobalt content. And cobalt yep. is um, a material that's pretty environmentally and socially impactful. And so yep. we want to decrease that. Yep. Okay. And um, yeah, and so if we have a high cobalt battery and we're manufacturing a low cobalt battery, should those batteries be repurposed? Um, right. And I did a life cycle assessment. And so I um, looked at just the environmental impacts and the findings were that, you know, so far based on like, best available knowledge, um, the batteries should be repurposed before they're recycled. But that doesn't take into account social impacts because that is very difficult to account for, yeah. <laughs> but I think somebody should look into it. Um, so that was that was the research question that I had. Um, my work with UCS is gonna be a lot of education to you know California uh, stakeholders and legislators and, uh, and policymakers around, you know, what are the issues with batteries and what policy should we do going forward? Um, so yeah, my role really will be a lot of uh, similar talks to this, but to different different groups. Fantastic. Well, we appreciate you using us as a um, as a uh, learning and uh, guinea pig. <laughs> Thank, yeah, you. thank, thank you. you for that. Sure. <laughs> no, our, our pleasure. Okay. And my, so my very last question for you really is, you know, uh, uh, sort of on that, on the big picture level, what, what parting comments would you have for us, um, you know, as somebody who has immersed herself in, you know, batteries, EVs, recycling questions, circularity, what, what are your, what big picture takeaways would you like us to, to have, you know, from this, from this conversation as, um, as researchers, as citizens and consumers, um, uh, you have, you have the floor. Um, what, what should we really take away today? Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, I think the biggest takeaway is, uh, you know, that, that people are thinking about the issues of material sourcing and of dealing with batteries when they've reached their end of life. And I think that's encouraging and there's, and it shouldn't hold people back from purchasing EVs and supporting EVs. Uh, that's one thing that I didn't kind of maybe realize until I, I finished my PhD that there was that, uh, and it really until I came to uh, the energy summit this, uh, this summer, that really helped me. Um, just to kind of learn the misconceptions of the field and how um, how people didn't know this research was going on. And there's a lot of this research. And um, and I think something 
I'm hopeful that there will be, uh, and there, there kind of already are solutions. Fantastic. Thank you for ending on a positive note. Um, and um, thank you so much for joining us today. We have really appreciated having um, having this window into um, a critical aspect of our energy transitions, right? How, how do we, this is part of how we transform transportation, which is a big and challenging area for us to, um, to move from where we are to where we want to be. So Jessica, thank you so much for being with us today. We really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much for having me um, and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. And so Stephanie, would you be willing to put up our slide of, um, of next upcoming events? This series will continue. The new energy series continues. We'll be having three more of these seminars over the course of the fall. The next one, two weeks from today um, with Bob Muwezi, um, who's a PhD candidate at UMass Amherst. He will be focusing on electricity consumption and complementary infrastructure for um, small and medium businesses in Kenya. So tune in again two weeks from today 12 to 1 for our next new energy talk. Um, if you are here in the Dartmouth area, in the Hanover area, we have a, um, a, a, a um, session, a seminar that will focus on unpacking the IRA, the infrastructure, excuse me, the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, what will it mean for climate and um, our energy transitions? So tune in for that. Um, visit us in person for that. Um, a panel discussion with Dartmouth faculty and more upcoming energy events from the um, Irving Institute are at our website at irving.dartmouth.edu. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us today. And we look forward to seeing you next time. Be well. <laughs>